a noise. Good. So um, today we'll uh, sorry we'll uh, show how to in, say improve the functionality of uh, the kind of web applications where, that we are being uh, developing up to now. Okay. Working we start working on the client side. So now we mainly work on on the server side to generate HTML pages, uh, and then uh, we use the server also to deliver REST uh, APIs and so on. Uh, we didn't uh, uh, invest too much on the client side, except for just the bootstrap styling and style sheets. Um, right now, what we had was uh, this kind of, of architecture actually. So the browser was basically a tool for rendering. Uh, the HTML page with the proper, uh, say, styles and colors and so on. The step we are starting today hmm, is uh, uh, to understand how we can extend programming and so customization and special behaviors also on the client side. Uh, since uh, 15 years, uh, uh, browsers have already included uh, uh, the ability to understand the JavaScript language. Hmm? Uh, what does it bring to us? What does it change? Um, the idea is that in the traditional architecture, in the traditional web architecture, once the document is delivered to the browser, it becomes a static page. You cannot do anything on, the, on an HTML page except maybe sending a form or clicking on a button. But the interaction capabilities on an HTML page are very, very limited, nearly zero. So developers of, of applications, and today we don't think and we don't speak of HTML pages or web pages. Rather, we always speak of web applications. Uh, this means that the look at the feeling for the user is to, that he's using something interactive not a set of pages that are interconnected by links. Uh, so the idea is uh, uh, we want to give uh, some interactivity on the HTML page itself. So once the page, the HTML is on the browser, the user should be able to interact with the page even without involving the server anymore. Because we want to do some drop down menus, we want to do some uh, uh, handling on the, on the of input data, uh, something like that. So we want to, in some way, to modify the behavior of the browser that just gives you a possibility of view, viewing the page, but also interacting with that. So we see that in, in two steps. In the first step, we will understand how to program some dynamic behavior in a web page without involving the server. And the next week, uh, we'll extend this uh, to uh, say um, add the capability of asynchronous connecting also to the server and so retrieving data in real time, but one step at a time. Uh, what are we changing in the in the architecture? Basically, in the in, the, in this architectural picture, what we have added here is a, a library, a module inside the browser that we call the JavaScript engine or the JavaScript uh, interpreter. It's a module inside the browser with, that is able to understand and execute a programming language. And this programming language is called JavaScript. So we learn the basics about JavaScript today. But before learning the language, we should understand what it can be used for. The JavaScript code is a software that runs inside the browser and has been download, downloaded by some web server, some remote server. So when I connect to a remote server, I get the HTML page. Then following the references in the HTML page, the browser will get also images, we know that, and we'll also get style sheets. Once I get the style sheet, uh, then the layout engine in the browser, we'll apply the rules in the CSS to make the uh, layout and the appearance of the page different. Uh, another item that the, the, the browser will retrieve from, from the web server 
are scripts. Scripts are external text files written in JavaScript, uh, in the JavaScript language that get delivered to the browser and are interpreted, extracted, and interpreted by the JavaScript engine. Hmm? So uh, this JavaScript engine is able to understand the JavaScript language and execute it line by line. JavaScript is an interpreted language, it's not compiled, so it would be executed line by line, just like Python. So this is the, uh, the ultimate goal of any virus developer. No? I write some code on uh, the server side and every user that visits my website will get a copy of my software and this software will run on their computer. So we are injecting some piece of code into every computer that visits our website. This is, could be potentially dangerous. It just, on the other hand, we, we, if we put ourselves in the shoes of the user, uh, when I visit some code given by the website, uh, say, owner, and they don't know what this code is doing. So it could steal my password, delete my files, or whatever. Hmm? So actually, there should be a great care for the browser to limit very strongly the, the capability, the environment in which this JavaScript code uh, will run. So this is not like downloading a program and then running it. The JavaScript will be interpreted in the context of the browser, and the browser will make sure, except if you have some bugs, but uh, theoretically the browser will make sure that the JavaScript code will not have access to the resources of, of my computer, but we will only have access to the resources, to a subset of the resources of the browser. So. This, uh, uh, from the security point of view, it's not uh, very easy, but uh, right now the implementations are quite robust from that point. So let's not, let's not imagine that we can write any code that can do anything on, on our client's computers. Uh, it can only run and see what the browser lets them see, lets the code see. In particular, the JavaScript engine is able to interact very strictly with the layout engine. So this JavaScript cannot read your hard disk, cannot write files, cannot read files, cannot open connection, cannot even know which tabs you have opened in your browsers, in your browser with other tabs besides their own you have opened. So it, it has a very limited page. The whole universe of this JavaScript is the current web page. The web page from which that specific source code, JavaScript code, has been loaded. So you have a web page. The, that web page refers to a JavaScript code. The JavaScript will download, will be executed, but uh, that JavaScript code will, can only see what is in the current page that for, from which it was loaded. It cannot see anything else, okay? And, uh, but mm, it has a very strict uh, it's a connection to the content of the page. This is what we want. We want some custom code to be able to understand what is in the page, maybe also what user, what actions the user is doing on the page, where he's moving the mouse, where he's clicking, what what he's writing the in the various parts of the of the page, and modify accordingly the content of the, of the page, enabling some field, uh, showing or hiding elements, uh, adding some information, and so on. So this code is able to uh, give interaction to the web page and there's only access to the website, to that web, to the resources present in that web page. So we need to learn actually JavaScript as a language before. Okay, it's a programming language, it's not, uh, it's, 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 it's typical issues, but uh, it's not very different from any other programming language. But then, most importantly, we need to understand what is the view that the JavaScript engine has on the, on the HTML page. Um, and this is the, this DOM, DOM, stands for Document Object Model. 
So an object oriented the representation of the content of the page that is fully accessible by the JavaScript engine. So JavaScript can modify the page, that specific current page, not the other ones, after it has been loaded, and it can modify it how it wants, even completely. A couple of uh, um, concerns about uh, standardization and compatibility. On the server side, I can use the programming language of my choice. There are no constraints. Uh, the web will work anyway. The web uh, protocols will never see the programming language that was used to generate my HTML file. So we are working in Python, we could be working in PHP, we could be working in Java or in .NET or whatever for generating HTML pages. Because I imagine the server, I choose the language, I choose the programming environments. On the other hand, the JavaScript code must be JavaScript. It cannot be any other language of my choice. I want to write it in Python. Well, but the browser will not, will not have the Python interpreter in there. I want to write it in C sharp. The browser will not have the C sharp uh, interpreter. So I need to write it in a language that will be understood by, by all the browsers. And all the browsers have one language installed, one language interpreter, which is the JavaScript interpreter. So I'm forced to use this language. Do, don't, don't you like Python working .NET? Okay. Don't you like JavaScript? Like it anyway, because you, you have no other choice. Hmm? Second, uh, uh, every browser is different. Internet Explorer is a different JavaScript interpreter than Chrome, which is different from the Firefox one, and so on. So the, but the implementation of the language is that's quite robust in all the major browsers, and it's quite efficient also. But for the layout engine, um, things are very different. Now, for example, Internet Explorer is made for Windows, and so the layout engine is very coupled, so the way of writing text and buttons and so, is very coupled with the Windows graphical libraries. Uh, which is different, for example, from uh, Firefox, which has an intermediate uh, representation, they call it the XUL, but we don't care, about uh, the kind of graphical objects. So the first is rendering the HTML into this graphical object, and the second step uh, would be rendering the graphical objects into Windows or, other the oper or the other operating system. My point is that this layout engine is highly specific, depending on the operating system, depending on the browser, and so on. So how can my JavaScript code run without modifications in different browsers running on different operating systems? The reason is that the JavaScript engine will never really speak or interact with the layout, the, the layout engine proper. But the layout engine should create an abstract, generic, and standard representation of the HTML page following this DOM format, with this DOM standard. So these DOMs are objects that correspond to the content of the page. We don't know how the browser really internally represents the page, the content of the HTML page. We only know that we have an API, an internal API, an interface made of classes and methods and attributes that we can use to manipulate the page. So we must be compliant with the standard of the language because it must be interpreted by all the browser, and the, our code must comply to the specification of the DOM, which are the only objects, the only resources that we can use inside the JavaScript program, and that represent uh, the current content of the page. Hmm? These are our two main constraints when programming in JavaScript. So let's uh, uh, dig a bit into JavaScript as a language. Hmm? Uh, I, I just make some flashes over these slides, then I will publish even a, a longer version of this one uh, if you want to read it with, uh, with more time. But uh, we, right now we, we don't need to, to, to learn uh, JavaScript with too many specifics because most of our uh, work will not be in client-side programming, but only a portion of that. So JavaScript is, a, is a really a complete uh, programming language. Hmm? We, use, we call it uh, JavaScript, uh, even though the real name 
should be ECMA script. Uh, being ECMA, the name of the standardization committee that issued the, 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 the standard version of the language itself. And the goal of uh, client-side programming is to add interactive functionality to web pages. And, uh, well, let's skip the, 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 the basic uh, information. Um, so the solution was to add a language interpreter to the browser, and uh, the Netscape Corporation, in version 2, uh, used this uh, uh, JavaScript language. Uh, so actually, if we, if we make a more detailed view of what happens inside our browsers, okay, on the right-hand side of this picture, you see the server. And on the left-hand side, you see the browser. Uh, the communication, of course, transfers the HTML and the JavaScript code from the server to the browser. And inside the browsers, HTML and JavaScript go different routes. HTML is just read, interpreted, and then rendered into the user window. Ideally, we can imagine that the HTML is read and then translated into DOM objects, and then these DOM objects will be rendered. This is just an hypothetical view. Maybe the browser is doing something very different uh, internally hmm? for efficiency reasons, to avoid this double translation. But we don't care. What we know is that the JavaScript gets uh, uh, cut out from the HTML, right. and then the JavaScript interpreter executes instructions. Every instruction can read and write DOM objects, can read and write information from the user window. So JavaScript can only interact with the page, DOM, and with the browser, with the specific tab or window in the browser that is hosting my page. Only these two resources are existing in, uh, in, uh, and, and accessible to the, to the JavaScript code. Uh, we, I said that uh, it was developed in 95 by Netscape, it was called uh, JavaScript. Uh, initially, Microsoft also copied that idea, but they, want, they didn't want to, to copy also the name. So in the first versions, Microsoft browsers used uh, a language that was called JScript, uh, which are actually identical. And then this difference was put together by a standardization committee. This is CMA, it's a Swiss uh, standardization uh, organization that uh, approved one official version of the language that was called the ECMA script. So officially, what we are using today is the ECMA script language. Everybody still calls it JavaScript. And JavaScript is a language that, uh, that, first of all, has nothing to do with Java. Only the name is similar. The reason is that uh, in the years in which JavaScript was developed by Netscape, uh, which was a very small startup at the time, and then became later a big corporation, but uh, at the time was quite unknown, uh, there was uh, the, some microsystem that was investing heavily on the Java language. So the first version, Java 2, uh, was, came out in those years. So there was a lot of advertising and information uh, and uh, technical push about the, la the Java language. People from Netscape said, okay, we can use the name Java uh, so that we are piggybacking onto the communication efforts uh, for the Java language. So they used a name that sounded like something that was cool and trendy at the time, hmm? but for no other reason. From the, for the syntax point of view, JavaScript is somewhat similar to C, to a C language. So in some way also marginally similar to Java. So we have a syntax made of uh, braces and not indentation, like in Python, made of semicolons, uh, made of variables, and uh, so it's, it's not sub the JavaScript uh, syntax is not surprising. Hmm? It's, uh, if, if you know C, you will be more or less familiar, except from some strange issues. But for the type system point of view, so how the objects behave, how the types are defined, it's much more similar to Python. So for example, C, like Java, you know that is a static typed language. If you write int A, 
the A variable is bound for, for the love of, of its own to always have integer values. You cannot put a, a double or a string in a variable that you declare integer. So the type of a variable is defined when you create it. In Python, you can use a variable a equal 27, so A will point to an integer object, and later you can put A equal to goodbye. And the same A variable will now point to a string object. So the variables in Python don't have a specific type on their own. They can point, they can refer to objects of different types at different times. Uh, and also the types of the objects can be changed. You can add uh, an attribute or a function to a type uh, any time during programming. So the type system of, of Python is a rigid uh, type system, so uh, every object has a specific type, but these types are dynamically computed and dynamically generated as the program runs. JavaScript uh, is uh, very similar to Python concerning the type system. So, if we are used to have uh, uh, variables for which we don't need to declare the type, okay, JavaScript is the same. If we can have a collection, for example, a list with items of different types in that, in JavaScript, in Python, we are used to do that. There is no constraint that all the elements in a list or in a dictionary should, be, should have the same type. The same can be done in JavaScript. If you are using Python to construct a dictionary with just one sentence, so building a complex data structure with just one statement, in JavaScript we can, we can do that too. While in C we cannot do any of this because we, we first should declare the structure and then define an array of structures and then so on. So we, it's more complex for handling complex data types. So uh, we, we learn this language, so you, you try to think in Python, but reading C, and more or less you understand what, uh, what JavaScript uh, is about as a language. But we know that we cannot click on a JavaScript file and execute it like with a Python file. JavaScript needs to be executed inside a web page, inside a browser. So first of all, for running a JavaScript file, we should learn how to include uh, a JavaScript file inside an HTML page. And this is very easy. Uh, actually, there's an, an HTML element, which is called script, that uh, uh, includes uh, uh, the code. Uh, you have usually two options. One of uh, embedding the JavaScript code into the HTML page, so script, then you close the script, and in between, we have JavaScript code. Or, much better, uh, point into an external file. So you have a script, and then with a the source attribute, like you do with your CSS, for example, uh, you have an external file uh, that points to, the, to a text file containing the, the JavaScript instruction, so that you can have your HTML file, or better in, in, in Flask, uh, your HTML template, that calls a separate file in which all the JavaScript is stored. Hmm? So this is the, the best option to do. We, we, um, we, want, uh, we don't want to put JavaScript code inside the page. We don't want to mix languages. We are trying to separate the concerns of the different applications. And uh, uh, what we can do with with uh, JavaScript, uh, well, the basic instruction for doing something is, for example, the, we have the alert command, which just pops up uh, a window with an OK button on that and stops the execution. It's useful, I mentioned that we, we never use it uh, in real JavaScript application because we don't want to block the browser window. But it's very useful for debugging. Huh? Instead of writing the, something on the console, we just pop up a window with a message. Hmm? Uh, but basically what uh, the JavaScript code can do is to modify the document. There is an object called document that represents uh, the current HTML document. And the write statement will add something at the bottom of the, of the document itself. So we can, this is a very crude way of doing that, we can modify the page by adding new information at the bottom. 
Of course, uh, we, it's not very useful by itself because normally we want to modify something in the middle uh, of the page, not just adding one line at the end. So we need to, to find more complex ways. But the key is always do the document object. Document is the name of a JavaScript variable that gives me access to the DOM. So what is in this picture is the DOM, uh, the document object model, is represented in the JavaScript program by the variable called document. It's, all, it's already predefined for you. So we, every manipulation we do on the web page we will start from the document object. Um, let, let me skip to the, to the language syntax. So uh, the, the syntax of, of JavaScript, I said, is similar to C. Uh, the if and for and while constructs are identical to C. The nesting of statements is done by curly braces. Many operators are identical. The variables are, are different. So, for example, just some flashes about the syntax. Uh, you have an instruction. For example, we call the write method on the document object. Uh, it's a normal call, function call. The comments are like C, double slash or slash asterisk or like Java, uh, variables uh, can be declared in, with the usual rules. Uh, for declaring a new variable, this is one difference. In C, you need to declare the type, int a char b. In Python, we, you just use it, a equal to, and you don't declare anything. In JavaScript, you should declare them with the word var, stand for variable, okay? So for declaring a new variable, you write, write uh, var x. This is a new variable. I don't associate any type with that variable. That variable can host an integer value at this point and it can host a string variable later on. Okay? Um, omitting, so forgetting the var is not an error. Uh, it's not a programming error. It's not a syntax error, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but uh, if you don't use the var, if you, if you forget the var, the variable will become global in JavaScript. So it will be accessible by all the JavaScript code that you write, uh, and this, of course, can bring you some programming errors very easily. Hmm? So try always to remember to put the var uh, in order to avoid um, generating global variables by chance and then will conflict across different modules. Hmm? Uh, this was, uh, unfortunately, for compatibility reasons with the first, very, very first version of the languages where we had only uh, global variables uh, available. Okay, uh, so we can use variables in the normal way, assigning values, uh, computing uh, um, expressions. Uh, for example, this one may, be, uh, may sound a little strange because x right now is a string. Uh, in JavaScript, it's not an error because then the, this plus, since one of the operands is a string, the plus will be interpreted as a, as a concatenation of strings. So the result of X in this case will be hello one. It's not an error. Um, and so the values of the variables are the usual types, booleans, numbers, strings, uh, and some particular objects that we, that we may use. Hmm? So. Nothing, nothing new. The operators are similar to the C ones: increment, decrement, multiplication, division, and so on. I don't want to make the, a boring list. No? Something that you expect. Uh, for strings, you may concatenate with the plus operator. Comparison operators are the expected ones, and uh, but there is a new one. Uh, you know, as in C, as in Python, as in Java, double equal means comparison, equality comparison. And in JavaScript, you also have a triple equal, that means equality and type comparison. So for example, I might, comp I might compare five as a number and five as a string, and the equality compar uh, comparison is true, because they first get converted to a common type and then they will be uh, compared. So JavaScript will always try to convert your variable to some compatible type in order to carry on with the operation. 
Sometimes you don't want it, but JavaScript will try anyway. Hmm? Uh, if you don't want uh, uh, JavaScript to do this type conversion prior to equality, you must use the triple equal. And so we compare the two values without attempt, attempting a conversion. And so five equal, five is a string, will be false with the triple equal. But it will be true with the double equal. Hmm? It's uh, convenient sometimes because you, it can save you some string to text and text to string conversion, uh, but in sometimes uh, can be also ambiguous. Uh, for example, if you have three and two, and three and two, in the first case, the result will be five, in the second um, uh, case, it will be 32. And depending on whether the JavaScript engine has done some conversion or some other conversion, so always be careful. Huh? We are grateful because JavaScript will do a lot of conversion for us, uh, but in some cases, uh, the result may be a bit strange. Hmm. Okay, control statements, uh, I won't spend more than 10 seconds because they're, they are identical to C to the C language, if, uh, braces, if, else, if, else, if, nothing changes. Also, the switch statement uh, is the same, if you remember something from the C, the for, while, do while, they are the same, they are copied uh, in, the, in the same way, so nothing, nothing new here. The break and continue, exactly identical. Okay, so what can we do uh, in a JavaScript code? Well, for example, we, we said that the basic form of, of uh, interaction is uh, maybe opening a pop-up box uh, with a message or asking for a yes, no question, so okay or cancel, or asking the user for a value. Hmm? These are interaction met methods that are managed directly by the browser, not by the HTML page itself. So they will open a new browser pop-up window. Uh, just to check it, uh, what, what we can try to do is to use I, uh, to play with our exercise. You remember, of course, the to-do list that we have been developing. So I made a version uh, which still doesn't have the rest uh, issues of the that you developed last week, so I, I came back uh, to the to the previous version that we, that we did together when we learned uh, um, Bootstrap. Okay, and so uh, I want uh, to add some interaction to these pages. This is nothing new; it is uh, our way, play our example. Hmm? that can enter a new uh, page and delete and so on, enter new and, uh, a new task and delete it, the various functionality. So how can I include uh, in this uh, application some JavaScript code? Uh, the easiest way to do that is to work uh, in the template. Uh, we remember that the template already includes different blocks, uh, the navigation bar, the content, and so on. And there is a one block that is called the scripts. Uh, you, we, we didn't use it last time because we didn't need it. In the scripts block, you can include all the scripts that you really need to include, all the JavaScript files that you need to run your application. They may be your own files or they may be JavaScript libraries that you download from somewhere else. And the scripts block, uh, you already include this super call, which uh, calls, uh, that includes the scripts uh, that are defined in the super class. Remember that our template is derived from a base template. The base template already includes some scripts. We don't know it. We didn't care about it. But this page, we didn't write any JavaScript for the moment. If you look at the source, you see that it includes uh, Bootstrap at the beginning, of course, but in the end, the last lines before the end of the body are including some uh, JavaScripts. Some JavaScript from Bootstrap and some JavaScript from jQuery, which is the library that we'll learn in a second. 
So some scripts are already included. If we want to add the, our own scripts without replacing, without deleting these ones, we should take care of including the old ones and then adding ours. So we can add a script with the script tag. The script tag has one important attribute, which is the source. So we just need to specify what is the name of the JavaScript file that we want to include. We can create a JavaScript file. I created it into the uh, JavaScript will be st a static element. Uh, the Python interpreter has nothing to do with that. It just, just only needs to, to, to copy, to serve it. So inside the static, uh, I created uh, uh, that's it one. Uh, uh, oops. What did I do? Okay, they want it. Okay. Inside the static folder, I created a JavaScript subfolder hosting all my JavaScript files. And for the moment, I only created one, which is empty, by the way, just as a placeholder. Um, PyCharms, of course, understands JavaScript. So when you create a new file, you, you have the JavaScript file option. Okay, so it will be created and recognized as a syntax uh, um, in, in as JavaScript. And so the instructions in this file are executed when the browser sees that tag. So when the browser sees the script, it will fetch the JavaScript, execute the instructions, and then continue loading the page. This is the reason why Flask puts the scripts at the end of the page. Because first we want to load the page, and then we want to execute the scripts. Once the page is already being loaded. Otherwise, if we had put, and sometimes we do that, the scripts at the beginning of the page, the script will be run before the page is available, before the page is even loaded. So they will see an empty page. They can't do anything useful at that point. We will learn how to do that. But uh, for the moment, just remember that we run the scripts once the page is already loaded. And so in our case, we can say, we can write an, an alert instruction with a message, I am here, semicolon. Uh, in JavaScript, semicolons are optional. You can forget them and go to the next line but I suggest always putting them hmm, for a better syntax. So what, what did I do? I included, uh, I still need to include the file name of this uh, JavaScript file. So URL4, it's a static file, static with file name, my name is uh, js slash to do list dot js. So at the end of the page, I will have a script source that JavaScript file name that is in the JavaScript folder. The JavaScript itself just contains the alert instruction. So when I reload this page, the page is loaded, as I expect, and then this pop-up window is generated by the browser. The server says, I am here, and this is my string, the string that I put in the, in the alert method. And the execution of JavaScript is blocked until I click the OK button. So it's a way of say the poor man's debug statements are just printing some value and then waiting to continue. If I click OK, then the page, the browser continues and continues loading the page. In this case, it was already complete, so there's nothing more to do. Um, there are other statements of this kind. So for example, we have a prompt 
box that asks the user for a value. So I could create a very stupid calculator by asking two values to a user and then writing the result, for example. So I could write, this is the prompt statement. I could prompt the user, insert A, and we store the result into variable A, and then we have a variable B prompt insert B, and finally we can alert, create an alert with the result, oh sorry, a string, the result is A plus B. Okay, so if I run it, I just need to reload the page. I'm here, insert A, three, insert B, five, the result is oh, 35. It's not eight, it's 35, why? Because A and B as, are read as strings. Hmm? And so, uh, which A is a string, B is a string, A plus B is the concatenation of the two strings. So you should need to do some explicit type conversion. This is the kind of surprises no, that we don't expect when using JavaScript. Uh, it's clear, but uh, the result is not A, it's 35 instead. Hmm? Uh, of course, we just uh, uh, we can just write a, an int cast for for yeah. Are there uh, placeholder like you see in the alert? Not in the alert. So the question was, uh, can I format the message uh, in some way? Uh, not in the alert. It just shows a string. Okay. Uh, there are string. There are as a method for the string object that do all the formatting, hmm? like in Java. But Actually, I have to be honest, this prompt and alert uh, are never used, except for basic debugging, okay? Usually, we, want, we don't want the user to interact with these ugly pop-ups windows. We want the user to interact directly with the content of the page. So we don't care about interaction of the JavaScript with the browser. We want to learn about interacting from the JavaScript to uh, the, the page, hmm? that we want to, where, we, where we want to go. Hmm? And that will be easier because we have all the CSS properties that are already typed. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to care, fortunately. Okay, uh, JavaScript is a language which is uh, it's double in nature. It's, a, it's an object-oriented programming, but it's heavily based on functions. So I need to tell something about functions because we'll use them a lot, really. Uh, okay, functions are very easy to define. Uh, in Python, we write uh, def, function name, and the list of parameters. In uh, JavaScript, we write function instead of def, function name, and list of parameters, without types, because we are not types. And uh, instead of the indentation, we have the braces, so nothing strange. Hmm? It's very normal. Uh, you can have no parameters, and uh, for you may have a return statement inside the function, of course. The return value may be Arbitrary, so nothing new since we are coming from Python. The only difference is that we write function instead of def, and we write we use braces instead of spaces of indentation. And of course, we can call the function with some list of parameters, and then the, the function body will be called. So, uh, the basic level of functions in JavaScript is very similar to C functions and to, to Python functions. Uh, we'll see, but later how they can, how functions are used into all the event handling mechanism that gets a, a bit more complex. And then, so we have the functional part, the, the, pro, the procedural part of the language, defining variables, defining functions, and the sequential statements. And then there's the object-oriented part of the language, which is Particular, we, we don't want, uh, we, we didn't do that in Python, we won't do that in, in, in JavaScript uh, uh, to, to describe how to design classes and objects in, in JavaScript. 
We only need uh, basically to learn how to use uh, uh, um, predefined objects, library objects. Mm. So an object, uh, an object is, a, is a data type uh, which has a current value made of a set of properties and uh, some methods that can operate on those properties, mm, on those current properties. This is a general definition that is valid for, for any object-oriented program. And uh, uh, what can you do with objects? Basically, you need to create them with a new operator. In Python, there is no new. We just call the name of an object and, uh, and it, it, it will construct it. And you can call methods with the dot operator on the object. We are used to do that. Uh, what are the, there are some, say, important predefined objects. Strings are one, of course. A string contains uh, values, quoted values, and they have the length property that, can, that you, can, you can read. So it's not size, it's length in this case. And there are some uh, uh, operations on strings. Uh, so extracting one character, concatenation, substrings, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, finding a string. So instead of inside S, find the substring ABC. Uh, replaces some, some strings. Uh, uh, extracting a portion from one character to another. So in, um, in Python, this will be slicing, no? when you slice a string from different uh, positions, conversions, and so on. And there are also old methods that are not used anymore to put uh, HTML tags around, surround a, str a string with HTML tags. But uh, we, we, don't, we don't use them anymore because we use CSS styles. These are coming from the first version of the language. Uh, the other important object is date. A date object is composed of a, uh, when you create it, it represents the current time, uh, but you can set uh, the, um, the date or the time with this uh, method, with the setting methods, and you also have a set of uh, getting methods for reading the date. Uh, so this is useful, for example, for creating clocks, uh, for writing the current hour on the page or some information like that. So uh, this is a one kind of object where you can set some value or can also read other values uh, and, uh, and convert them to strings uh, or to localized strings uh, and so on. These are just examples of the, of the main objects uh, that, uh, that we, we could use. Hmm? Uh, other objects are arrays. Hmm? We don't have lists uh, in JavaScript. We call them arrays. So you can create an array like this, uh, which is a dynamic uh, data structure. It's not like a C array, it's more like a Python string uh, list. Mm -hmm. When you can add the values as you go, the indexes are always integer numbers from zero on. And then you can, if you set a, a2, it will create a new element if it doesn't exist already. So it will expand automatically. Um, and then you have the length property on the array for iterating on that. There's no nice iterator like in Python. You need to construct the four, like in C, from zero to the length value. Um, but the good, the good part uh, compared to C is that you can query the array for asking for its current length. Hmm? And there are operations on the arrays, slicing, concatenation, sorting, all the basic operations. I, I'm, I'm running over this slide because you, you, you may have them as reference, uh, but we, we don't need to be picky about all these details right now. Hmm? Two useful methods are joining and splitting. Hmm? Uh, it, it comes often uh, in the user interfaces. You have a set of values in an array, and you want to construct a string with all the values separated by comma. So you use a join. Otherwise, you have a set of value separated by a comma, and you want to split to create an array with one item each, uh, and so you can use a split over a string. So you, if you split a string, you get an array. If you join an array, you get a string. Um, then you have the, the math object, which is very simple, because it mainly contains the mathematical constants uh, and the mathematical functions. Uh, we, we don't use a lot of trigonometry, but uh, basically we use a lot of rounding, uh, rounding absolute values and so on in our application. 
uh, to compute the values and uh, to, to, to move the items in the, in the interface. Okay, this is just, we could learn a new language tomorrow morning and we have the same information. The basic syntax, the, basic, the data types, and the basic library. What is more specific in JavaScript is that it's running inside the browser and it can handle all everything that happens on the web page. And everything that happens on the web page is called event. So an event is uh, the indication, the fact that something happened on a web page. Uh, what, what may change on a web page? Well, the user may change something, may write something to a field, may click somewhere. Even just moving the mouse over the web page uh, is an event that happens on a web page. Or the browser may do some action on the web page. For example, the, uh, the browser may start loading an image, may finish loading an image. These are two different events. Huh? So everything, sorry, every time that something happens on a web page, the browser will generate what we call an event. Okay, their business. What we can do in JavaScript is that for any type of event that is generated, we can attach an event handler, which is one function defined by me. So I can decide that when the user clicks on the title of the page, I want to do something. So clicking on the title of the page is an event which is generated normally. If I'm clicking somewhere, I will generate the click event. Even my moving the mouse will generate the mouse moved event. But what I can do is to re redefine. Usually most of the events are just thrown away, are just ignored by the browser. We don't need to deal with them. But we can decide that we want to intercept some events, some specific events, and to attach our own code to those events. Okay? So uh, we may attach an event handler to most or to all of the events that happen in the page, and then the an event handler in this case is any JavaScript function. So this means that every time that specific event is generated, my function is called. So usually the, the JavaScript code is not executed like this at the end of the page, like we did here, but will be executed later when the user will do something, will click on the title. And what is the mechanism for attaching an event handler to a specific event? There are two ways. This one is the simple one in HTML, and then we see the later, the more complex one in JavaScript. The simple one is just inside the HTML using some own attribute. On click gives the name of a JavaScript function that will be called when the click event is generated by this input element. So clicking on a title is different from clicking on a text, is different from clicking on an image. Every HTML element will generate their own events depending on what the user is doing with them. So you can tell a specific HTML element when this event, click, is generated by you, call this function. So I'm in, in the JavaScript jargon, I'm attaching a new event handler to the click event for the input element. So, uh, for example, let's throw this away. And we want to do something when the user clicks on the on your tasks, okay, on this box. So I go to the template. This was the div that contains the your class. I just need to attach on click 
one function that they call the uh, title clicked. And that's it. I can attach the event tender to the div or to the h2 as I prefer, depending on whether I just want to intercept the clicks on the name, on the string, on the title, or even on the on hold the surrounding box. And title clicked is a function. in which uh, I write some message, ouch. Hmm? So the page will feel pain whenever we click there. So if we try it, we reload it, the page is nice, nothing happens. If I click there, the page says ouch every time. I close it. I click there, again. If I click somewhere else, nothing happens, okay? So all the click events that are captured inside this div, this part of the page, are routed to my function, okay? Uh, okay, nice, but useless. Hmm? Uh, it's easy to, why? It's easy to intercept, so we can, for example, we could, uh, Intercept the enter key. Inter when the user writes something here, I could check before sending the enter. For example, if I right now, if I click on enter, uh, I will send an empty form, an empty task. In this case, this empty task will not be inserted into the database by the backend logic. But the best part should be to validate it before. So when I click on enter, I want to first to check whether the task is not empty. Uh, for example, when I click on delete, I want to ask confirmation to the user. Do you really want to delete? Okay, so I'm changing the way the browser handles its events. In this case, it's a submit event or a form. In this case, it's a click event on a link. Remember that it looks like a button. It looks like a button, but it's a link, really. We, do it, we did this with an A styled with bootstrap. So it's just, just a link in this case. So we want to modify, uh, we could uh, modify the click event on this link or the submit event on this form. There are a lot that we can, uh, what is it? I had a table, I lost that, sorry. Uh, is it, okay, here. There are a lot of different events that we may want uh, uh, to redefine. We want to redefine the behavior. On any element, we, most elements, we can intercept mouse events, click, double click, and then the most fine events, mouse pressed, and released, and moved, usually, unless we are building our own drag and drop function, we don't need these ones. But click and double click may be useful. Uh, or keyboard elements, when you write something, when you press the A key, you generate three events. Key down for A, uh, key up, and then, so the A has been pressed, the, B has been, the A has been released, and then key press. That is generated after the whole cycle down and up uh, is complete. So usually the event that you want to intercept is key press. When you're writing something in a form, Imagine the autocomplete forms that we have. Every time you write something new, the key press is intercepted and new completions are shot by, by the JavaScript software. Form elements, all the elements of the form, the form element, the input element, the checkboxes and so on, generate a lot of events on focus, on blur, when, you, when, you, when the cursor goes on them or leaves them. On change, uh, when you leave uh, an element uh, with, a, with a value which is different from the value that you had when you enter the element. So you may just enter and exit, don't change anything, okay. If you enter and exit and change something, it will generate on change on exit from the element, which is different from key press. Key press is every time you write, uh, even when you go left and right with the arrows, 
are, they are key presses. But they don't generate on change until you leave hmm, the element and you, you move to the next one. So they are useful for validating a value after it has been, uh, after you finish to, to write it. And then the most important one is uh, on submit, which is an event that is generated not by the individual input elements, uh, rather by the form element that uh, correspond to the submit button of the form itself. So before sending the form to the server, you can redefine, uh, you can insert your own JavaScript function. So intercepting HTML events is easy, uh, but uh, it's only half of the job. We say that I want to, when I click on enter, I want to check whether the task has been written. So in the JavaScript that I can call on the click event of this button, I need to read the value of a different field, of a different element. Okay? How can I do that? I need to, so I'm here, this is the source, I'm in the submit button. When the user clicks here, I need to read the value of the, this other input element. So first of all, how to do that? I need to reach that input element and then read its property. This is where the DOM comes into place. The DOM is a programming abstraction over the HTML. So I will have one DOM object that represents this input element with many attributes, and the attributes will be the type, the name, the value, and so on of the input element. And I would be interested in the value field, so what's written inside. So uh, from the JavaScript, I need to query the DOM and ask the DOM, please give me the input element that they want as an object. And when I have the object, I query the properties of the object. I can read them, I can change them. Uh, so I will see the HTML not as a file, but as a tree of elements. HTML actually is a tree of nested elements. The HTML contains heading body, body contains links, contains titles, and so on. Each of these is a node object in the DOM. Each of them, depending on its type, has different properties. I can see that in the inspector of the browser. When you can see all the properties of the elements. So if you, if you go to, for example, this uh, item, you see that uh, this, uh, I selected this node input here, and here on the right hand, I see the DOM properties of the object representing this input. And it has different uh, attributes. For example, one is the, I go down, the value, which is empty right now. If I write something, uh, the, in this input, the value should change. Which is that? Okay, you see that the value attribute has changed. So when the user is doing something on the screen, on the web page, the properties of the elements in the DOM will change in real time. And also the other way around, I can, if I modify, if I modify a value Can I modify it here, or is it just read-only? No, it's the read-only in this case, uh, in this inspector. I, it, but in JavaScript, I can modify this property, and it will change in real time the content of the page. So,
How, how can I do that? Well, we need first uh, maybe two main, okay, the, the idea of, uh, of nodes is quite easy. Uh, we need to learn two basic primitives. How to find a node, a DOM node, and how to modify their properties. Finding a node is uh, done with uh, uh, two search methods. One is, uh, the second one is the most used one, is called get element by ID. Remember the IDs that you use in CSS with the hash code, hash ID, for matching a single element? Those IDs that was a unique identifiers in the HTML page? Okay, I, we can query with those. If I have an ID for an element, I can ask to the DOM, please give me the reference to the, the element with that specific ID. Hmm? Otherwise, I could navigate with more generic methods, for example, get elements by tag name. So a tag would be an input, or an, an H2, or a div. And it will, will retrieve all the tags as, a, as an array, you see the plural, not elements, but not element, but elements in this case, because there may be many. But why, if we search by ID, you will, we will always have one, or at most one. So, in our case, we want to redefine the behavior of the uh, submit button, for example, by changing the, what, what happens when, you, when we click it. So we on click, on click. Hmm? I want to add a check form method, fu function, sorry. So I'm adding a check form event handler to the click event on the input element. And check form is the name of the function, so I need to define a different function. Check form in my JavaScript file. Uh, we are starting to think that the JavaScript file will consist mainly of a set of function definitions. So actually this file will not contain any executable instructions, any instruction to be done right now. Huh? Only functions that will be called when needed. Right? So we, we, we are thinking in an event-driven way. Our, our code is driven, the execution of our code is driven by the events that come from the user, which is normal uh, way of programming in user interfaces. Um, so we, we should, we want to read the current value of the input element. Well, first we need to find the input element. So we need to give an ID to that element. We, didn't, we don't have any ID, so we add one, uh, which is uh, the description input, for example. ID, description input. So to remember me that this matches with the input element that contains the description. So uh, the input element that we want is a document dot get element. You see all the methods, get element by class name, by name, by ID, by tag name, and so on. What they want is a, most of them return a node list, a list of elements, and this one only returns one single element, which is the preferred one when we know the element. And we write the name of this element. So right now input points to a DOM node. Uh, we want to extract one property from the node and to show it, just to, to check that we were able to read it, for example, and this property would be the value property. Hmm? 
Uh, I remember that this property is called value, but you should check the DOM documentation that gives you for every node the list of properties that you have. So you can do that interactively with the browser or with the, uh, or if you search online on the W3C school, uh, you have all the list of DOM uh, attributes. So this input value, the text by the user, I extract that as input value. And for example, I can just alert it, um, you wrote this text. That's to, just to show it. As a first test. So if I click on it, I write, I am here, I click on enter, you wrote, I am here. Okay, so I executed my code. My code uh, was uh, triggered by the enter button, but then the code interacted with the input element. When I click OK, the execution continues and the form is submitted because the click action will be complete. I can also prevent the click action from happening by returning false from this method. So what I can do is to check if, if the text length is different from zero, okay. Otherwise, return false. And returning false will uh, invalidate my click action. The click event will be destroyed, it will not be processed by the form. And so actually I will not submit the form. Uh, length, yes, unresolved variable, length, why? Because it's written with the H. I always have the H wrong in length. So for example, I reload it. If I enter something, I have this pop-up, you wrote something, I know. Okay, it's added. If I click it without entering anything, you wrote nothing, of course. I click on the okay and it's not added to the picture because the force has just uh, uh, blocked the, the, the propagation of the, of the event. So the programming in JavaScript always follows this kind of pattern. I have an HTML object, button, a text, an input element, whatever I want form, that from which the user does something. When the user does something, the browser automatically generates an HTML event. When this event is generated, I might have an event render function defined for that element. Okay? Uh, so if I define an event render for that event, my function is called before the normal processing of the event. My function can do what, what it wants. It has full control over the page. Usually, my function will need to read the, the current properties, the current values of some elements in the page. Did you check that box? Uh, is that uh, text field or not? And then maybe modify some other pro properties of other objects. So usually in these event handlers, you find three types of actions. Finding elements, get reading values, properties, from some element and modifying properties from other elements or the same ones. So basically JavaScript programming is understanding which events uh, you want to, to, to match and understanding which, on which objects you need to interact with them. Uh, of course, it's very dangerous in some way or because if you 
JavaScript is a so dynamic language that if you write something wrong here, uh, you write two H's. It's not a syntax error. And even the browser, let's try it. I reload the page. We not complain. You wrote, we know, and then it continues. Just the execution of JavaScript is stopped whenever you find an error or a non existing property and so on. The browser doesn't give, give you an error. It doesn't give you an exception like you do when, when you're writing something in Python, it gives you an exception and stops the, the execution. Here, JavaScript just forgets and then continues the execution. So it's, it's quite difficult because you don't have a, a strict syntax validation in the editor and you don't have strict syntax validation in the execution environment. And so it's very easy to use the wrong uh, variable name or the wrong property or the wrong element ID. By the way, the browser has no way of knowing whether this ID is present in your template or not because they are in two different files. You can cross check. So the DOM manipulation is Okay, it allows you to do anything, but it's somewhat a bit dangerous, a bit complex. Hmm? Uh, so what, you, what we will learn to do is to use a library, which is called jQuery, that, uh, let's say, makes it much more, much simpler, let's say, to do these four main actions. Associating JavaScript uh, event handler, finding objects and reading and modifying object properties. Uh, next time we learn the, this jQuery library and we see that it's much, much easier to do simple things like we did and uh, it will become uh, also very easy to do more complex things, okay? So, but the basic idea is always this one. It, the only difference is that instead of using uh, the methods of the DOM which are very limited in scope. Right now we just show very, very simple examples. Uh, but if you want to, show, to do something like uh, uh, when you click on any of, the, of these messages, uh, change it to red, for example, to, uh, to the red color, then you, you will have a bunch of, uh, of, of very long uh, JavaScript, uh, very long JavaScript because you cannot specify one I, different IDs. You need to search lists and then navigate the tables uh, I, I don't want to inflict on you this kind of code. Uh, we see that uh, with jQuery, it's a couple of instructions. You can also do uh, blocks of operation in one instruction. Mm -hmm. So it gets, uh, what people say is that I'm not programming in JavaScript, I'm programming in jQuery. Mm -hmm. Because most of the instructions uh, are just function call to this uh, jQuery library that we will learn next uh, Thursday, I guess, because on Monday, uh, we had, uh, there are no classes, it's, uh, it's all day. Hmm? Okay? Okay, so we have a break for, for the next class. <laughs>